to set the stage. Raise your hand if you use Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Just a few. Who uses it for professional purposes? Maybe a couple. Who uses it for personal purposes? Who is afraid of using it for professional purposes? <laughs> That's what I want to hear. So one of the main things is that when we, uh, but this closure, <laughs> this is was funded for the Wisconsin Partnership Program. Thank you very much. And also I'm one of the primary care research fellows. Every time that we hear the word social media, 99% of the time is something bad. It's either misinformation is rampant. There's a lot of things that are being said about in social media. There's bullying happening. There's the people that get harassed in social media. And this, this is a pretty nice, even documentary by John Oliver explaining why this information is particularly bad social media in non-English languages. But then there's also a lot of power in social media. And there's a lot of good things that come from social media if we know how to use it. These conversations have been happening for a long time. This paper is from 2018. What it says basically is a lot of the misinformation is deliberately created to create a problem. This is not the half of the comments, the trolls, is not somebody that of the goodness of their heart that they think they're doing the right thing. Half of the comments that are in social media creating discourse and misinformation are deliberately created to do that. Which purposes? We still don't know. This is a lot of discussion in that sense. But we're going to talk about a little bit more of how to use it. During the COVID-19 pandemic, there's been a lot of guides, a lot of kits, a lot of social media toolkits created by different organizations to help us disseminate information accurately. This paper came in May of this year, 2021. And I want to highlight a couple of the aspects that they mention here. First one, first one, form partnership with community organizations to combat mistrust and build public confidence. Second one, engage with voices and perspectives of trusted messengers who have roots in the community. It's two different points. It's not the same thing. We are referring to two different things. And third, engage across multiple accessible channels. Be where people is. And this is very, so who are we talking about? The three platforms that I mentioned are completely different on who their users are. So, once upon a time, March 2020, we know what happened. Suddenly we went from sharing information in health fairs, community settings, let's go to the market, let's go to the farmer's market, we, let's go to the church. We went from that to nothing, zero. Over one weekend, we went from, I don't know if it's safe to go out and share this information with the community. But what did we know then? Internet is a powerful source. All the universities, academics, work employments are starting to move all of the tools, works, meetings, everything went to the internet. But many of us had to figure out how to reach our communities that don't have internet, or if they have it, they are not the ones that are going to log in into this town hall Zoom meeting that happens at 3 p.m. on a Wednesday afternoon to get the information that they needed for COVID-19. And that's where this project started. It started with Dr. Kerry Gleason. She has an advisory board um, for her brain health uh, community, and they say we need to get information out. We need to make sure that our communities here in Madison have the most important information, but also that the information is addressing their needs. And that's where also came partnerships with the Oneida Nation and the Latinx community in Wisconsin. <laughs> this is my team, and each of these people is extremely important in making this happen. Why? Because building those communities relationships means that we need to hear what people need, but we need to say the things in a way that they will want it, that way they will understand it. So, PIs for this project, Dr. Kerry Gleason, Melissa Metoxen, we have our community advocates. Um, 
these are people from the community. Venus Washington was brought on board because she's a lifestyle fitness expert in Wisconsin. She has many multiple co uh, community connections and she's a trusted sort of information, health information. Sashin Lawrence, she's a member of the Oneida Nation. She has workouts and different outreach activities, but her job has never been outreach. Her job was not a science communicator. No, her job was, she's a mom of seven, she has a PhD, she has worked in different activities. Ashley and Lisbeth are students here in Madison that have different perspectives of the different things that they are hearing from la younger Latinx communities and the Latino Health Council. We partner with the Latino Health Council, why? Because it's not only about reaching out those that have social media, but how do we disseminate this further? And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But this team, the way that it works is that they need information. The community advocates are responsible to share the messages, but they need to know what's medically accurate. So they are not, they are addressing the questions in a way that, hey, oh, that's how the vaccine works. And explain it in a way that people understand. So we have a, oh, sorry. So we have a team from university, investigators, physicians, and other individuals that came on a weekly basis to talk with our community advocates and talk about, okay, let's talk about what's the topic for next week. What's what they need to do? And created messages that we share to mostly Facebook. Why? Facebook is the most widely used tool among the com our communities. And these messages then were evaluated to see how many times were they shared, how many times they were liked, how many people really engaged with those messages. And today I'm going to tell you the role of that trusted messenger. Because it's easy to say, find trusted messengers, find trusted messengers. Well, but that's expensive, but I don't have time. I don't know who's the trusted messenger. Well, I'll tell you why exactly that's important. But these messages were more just like, hey, use the mask. Now, uh -uh. in order a message to be really effective, we found that they need to build capacity. They really need to explain what the things that people need to do and why. Healing is a cultural and a spiritual. The weight of this message is that, and this relates to the third one, promote healing and mitigate harm. We don't want to use our messages to spread panic. We want to use the messages to give hope, get skills, give resources, and make people feel better about the things that are happening. And finally, it's responsive to community needs. And this, I, I love the way that this is explained, and this was developed by Dr. Ornella Hills. She's one of the team members. Because also, it's a, we, and that's an expertise that we brought together. It's a communications expert and graphic and technology design expert. Our community advocates were not influencers. They were not having all the skills to, this is how you edit a video, and this is how you do a TikTok. No, they were people from the community that got a team behind them to, teach, to help them create and share these messages. And I'm going to share many examples created by Ashley Benitez. She's an undergraduate here at UW Madison, and she ever is, if she ever sees this video, she's awesome. <laughs> um, these messages were more than just pictures. But if you have a picture, they have to be culturally relevant. They have to speak to the community that we're talking about. They have to connect with the people. They have to be visually appealing bright colors, but also branding. They need to know that where these messages are coming from. What's the affiliation? Um, the information has to be easy to understand, very quick. The shorter, the better. Why? People start scrolling. They have to have maybe 10 seconds for people to decide, do I want to read them more in depth? Yes or no? That's what it comes down to. But also, this is something that we learned maybe have halfway to the project. People really like to talk. Instagram stories, or when you ask polls, when you ask people to engage with your content, is more effective. People want to have their voice heard in one way or another. So just having a post saying, here, use the mask, maybe got a few likes. 
hey, what do you think about using the mask? Or, hey, what do you think about this? Will you do this? Engage 100 times more people. Visual. We did this many, many, many videos. Things that we noticed, short videos, one minute, one, one minute 30, that reflect the most important aspects. We're more likely to engage people. I was surprised about this one. I have to admit, I thought people would not sit down to watch the whole video. Turns out they like it, short videos. But I think this might be related to the platform. This is people in Instagram that go through the reels, that go through the stories. So they're looking for that type of content. The results over 10 months, 11 months, that they were, all these messages were shared. We shared 477 posts across our three communities. Engaging 130,000, no, 130,000 people and engaging almost 10,000 people. But then we go back to the first point, trusted messengers. And I'll show, I think uh, the next image will show why that's important. Uh, this is just a regular link from the UW Health. UW Health has a very good reputation or community. The link is in Spanish. Uh, we share like, hey, where did you get your information about the COVID vaccine? From the Latino Health Council Facebook page. They are recognized and trusted messengers in general. 77 people reach, nine engage. And engage means they liked, they shared, or they comment. Okay, well, let's make a, the image a little more appealing. What about this, this kid is cute, oh, looks so powerful. Still, 78 people engage. In social media terms, it's not bad, it could be better. Okay, let's see if there's a real person. It's a video for Dr. Armando Dialba. He's a faculty in Nebraska. We usually share some of his information. He shared a video of him getting the COVID vaccine. 138 people reach. Okay, we're getting there. We're getting there. Dr. Rivera, he's a, what do we call, equivalent to Dr. Oz, maybe, on the Spanish community. So he speaks Spanish, but I say it's a little different. So he speaks Spanish. He's the person that many Univision, I think, brings in their news to discuss health topics. A lot of people know him. He's a trusted source. Yep, 163. By this point, we're thinking, hey, do we need to bring Ricky Martin here? <laughs> um, and then our main and the most important messengers that we have, our community leaders. 2,000 people rich, 232 people engaged. She's a community leader and she's saying, I got my shot. It's you can do it too. 2,000 people. When the message comes from somebody that people know, it gets shared 24 times more in average. 24. What's the application of this for everything else that we do? If you post a flyer in the market and you get two people to call you back for the study, she calls, she calls or shares that, you will have 24 to 48 people more calling you about the study. That's the power of the trusted messenger. But it's also about the message. Because as we see here, all of these posts came from the same page. So we have the community organization on our side. We have the reputation of the community organization. But they are not engaging. When people see her, they react. They say, oh, if that's for her, it's also for me. Maybe I should ask more about this. So. I would like to encourage discussion here, and that's why I didn't add more information. But the main thing is that the messenger and the message are together. And it depends on who you're trying to reach. We are trying to reach um, many, many groups of people. But if, for example, you're going for younger generations, Instagram is for millennials. If you want Gen Z, TikTok. If you want older adults, Facebook. If you want people that's not connected to social media, radio. And we are still thinking how to use the power of social media to disseminate information, but it still is an important consideration when we do studies. It's not just about sharing a message, a post, 
It's about making it engaging, inviting people in, and there's being responsive to community needs. So having uh, boots on the ground that could tell you this is what people need to know. Thank you very much. And uh, let's open to questions. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Martin. So we have about five minutes for questions. Yeah, so I'm very ignorant when it comes to social media and processing things, but I was wondering if you found that if there's any kind of relation or covariate with regards to like time of day or day of the week that you post, or if that matters, or algorithms kind of make that help you. <laughs> it matters, and it depends on who you're trying to reach. But also it depends on the algorithm. So the way that social media is designed to is that they want to keep you hooked and they want to keep you engaged. So people, um, we have seen that, for example, post at 9 a.m. versus 3, 6 p.m. for us is not that different because we are reaching people that have, is following the our page. But if you were in marketing, they will post at three or four different times and figure out who is the people trying to buy your product and post on those specific times. And all of that is in the social media analytics. Believe it or not, anybody that posts something, could you could go and look in your post and see how many people reach, when, how, where are they from, who are they? There's a lot of information that's for free available in these platforms that you can figure out when your post does the best. For us, where, for example, if it's associated with a day of an event, when we, La Dia de los Muertos last year, we posted five days before, it got a little traction. We posted the day off, it got 10 times more traction. Uh, 9 a.m. versus 9 p.m., for us, there was not that much difference. But it might be different for each, for other groups. When is there some more questions? <laughs> KJ? Yeah, this is fascinating. I'm wondering if there's any literature or just sort of best practices from the marketing world around how you engage in social interaction like this that you used or that you are going to plan to use going forward to really boost what you're trying to achieve with outreach? So well, as usual, most of the information exists is not specifically tailored for Latinos, African Americans, nor Native Americans. And most of the marketing, and one of the things that we're trying to figure out is the difference between marketing and health promotion. When you can pay for an advertisement and what you're looking is for people to buy something, it's not the same when you're trying to tell them, hey, could you change this behavior? Or this is why you, you start to use into mask or get vaccinated. And that's the study, that, that part of the study that we're looking right now, if there's any more information. But right now, one of the things is that social media in academics worse has not been seen as researchy enough. Uh, it's an adjunct to research, but not the main research aspect. So that's one of the things we're trying to figure out of what else is out there. And Tana, you have a question? No? You actually answered it. <laughs> Victor, <laughs> please. Um, Mona, I'm curious. This is a great um, Have you uh, thought about doing subsequent, like, qualitative research asking what kind of, how do we say, like, negative social media is the same popular group is grappling with, you know, juxtaposed against the positive messaging? I'm just wondering how... What, what information, particularly for BIPOC communities, is out there in the literature about that? There's some information, but we are actually doing, we're planning for the focus groups all 2022. We have nine focus groups scheduled, and we're going to try different, like showing two messages, like a positive, a negative, and a different aspect, and ask people what you think, what draws you in, or what doesn't, or does that turn you off? Uh, so that's part of what the things that we are learning, and we hope to expand more, because it's the in the Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities, that's there's very limited information on that. But yeah, that's a great point, and thank you so much for bringing it up. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you.